Good evening. I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, U.S.-China talks begin, and so does the trial of one of Canada's two Michaels. I don't see the Chinese backing down from holding hostages. We're outside the courthouse in China. Also tonight, the U.S. opens up a new vaccine supply for Canada. Ensuring our neighbors can contain the virus is a mission-critical uh, step. Why Montreal is suddenly prioritizing shots for certain parents. This is a big priority because uh, we are scared, you know? And the trials and troubles of the AstraZeneca vaccine. We want our science to be black and white. And science is quite messy. How it got so controversial and what the cost might be. This is The National. Well, we begin tonight with breaking news from China in the trial of Michael Spaver. He's one of two Canadian men detained in that country for more than two years now, accused of espionage. It is all tied to a larger geopolitical dispute involving the U.S., and Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Freelance reporter Patrick Falk is outside the court for us in China tonight. Patrick, what's the news? Well, look, it's been a frustrating day in many ways. The court proceedings went on for at least two or three hours. We were, of course, expecting a swift verdict, but we did not get that. The headline, of course, is that there has been no verdict. So one must assume that the court will go away now and continue to deliberate. Uh, Jim Nicholl, the deputy head of mission uh, for the Canadian Embassy, said it was disappointing and it was uh, difficult to see or it was hard to understand what exactly went on inside the courtroom. As we know, Canadian diplomats were not allowed access. And he told us also that he wasn't even allowed to see Michael Spavel before the proceedings uh, began. And he also said it's very clear to understand where everything goes from now. He thanked supporters that were here today in Dandong. Notably, uh, there were diplomats from several countries that uh, came to stand in solidarity with Michael Spavor. Uh, one of the things we were also hoping today was to get a, a glimpse of Michael Spavor for the first time, essentially, since he was detained. Uh, we did not get that because it was whisked into the courtroom, which is right behind me here in a police vehicle that was with blacked out windows and whisked away afterwards uh, very, very quickly indeed. So we did not get uh, a chance to see him because, of course, we wanted to know a little bit more about his condition. Uh, Mr. Nickel did tell us uh, that he was not able to share any details about uh, his condition because of privacy laws uh, in Canada. But the reality is that Canadian officials in all likelihood don't know exactly what condition he is in either. Uh, he told us earlier today that the last time that they uh, were able to visit him was on February 3rd. Uh, so that is all the detail that we have for the time being. Of course, we will continue to follow this story very closely. But for the time being, that's it from me. Back to you in the studio. Now, many see the timing of this trial as strategic, much as they view the arrests themselves. That is to say, a case of China exerting pressure on the Meng Wanzhou extradition proceeding just as it begins major diplomatic talks with the United States. David Cochran has that side of the story. They've been in Chinese prisons for more than 800 days, and the Chinese government is telling the world it's all legal and proper. The Chinese judiciary had those cases independently according to law. That reassurance offers no comfort to Michael Spaver's family, who on the eve of trial issued a statement, saying we feel it is necessary to speak out and call for his unconditional release. His continued unjust detention depriving him of his liberty is both unfair and unreasonable. That's also the position of top U.S. officials meeting with their Chinese counterparts in Alaska, where things got tense. We'll also discuss our deep concerns with actions by China, including in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan. The United States itself does not represent international public opinion. And neither does the Western world. We will always stand up for our principles, for our people, and for our friends. 
Those friends include Canada, which hopes U.S. pressure can help secure the release of the Michaels. But with Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou still facing extradition and the U.S. equally dug in, this meeting is unlikely to settle things. I don't see the U.S. backing away from seeking the extradition of the um, Huawei CFO. And I don't see the Chinese backing down from holding hostages. So um, it may come up, but I, I would not be overly optimistic about the outcome. There's also little optimism about the outcome of the trial as conviction rates in China are greater than 99 percent. The media and the public are banned from the courtroom and to this point, Canadian government officials are being told they can't attend either. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning now to COVID-19 and some welcome news from the U.S. today. Washington will ship a big batch of its AstraZeneca doses north. Canada can expect one and a half million more AstraZeneca doses by the end of March. They're being loaned, and the U.S. wants a similar number in return sometime down the road. But right now, it helps. And as Catherine Cullen reports, more good news on the vaccine supply could be coming. God bless America. They're coming to our rescue. Thank God. You don't get a much better reception than that. Still, there's caution. President Biden, thank you. And once I get them, I will call you the champion, but I need to get the delivery first. In fact, the deal is not quite sealed. It's not fully finalized yet, but that is our aim and what we're working toward. And it's a loan. Canada would get 1.5 million doses of AstraZeneca soon, at a time in this country when shots are still in short supply. We are looking at receiving those doses in very short order, uh, likely before the end of the month. Canada would swap, sending vaccines back to the U.S. likely later this year. Tomorrow, we will hit 100 million doses our administration has administered. The U.S. is far ahead in its vaccination efforts, but this week it was accused of hoarding. The FDA hasn't approved AstraZeneca for use, so tens of millions of doses are reportedly just sitting in an American factory. Now, the Americans are ready to share. Some with both Canada and Mexico. Ensuring our neighbors can contain the virus is a mission critical uh, step, is mission critical to ending the pandemic. And there could be more to come. And we also anticipate having additional doses of Moderna, of Pfizer. Though many countries want them. Canada says it's made a number of requests. We are pursuing all possibilities for the earliest acceleration of vaccines into Canada. Officials are now predicting Canada could have 9.5 million vaccine doses by the end of this month, up from the originally anticipated 6 million. Progress, but still far from the finish line. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Quebec is launching an aggressive new vaccination blitz in two Montreal hotspots, the goal being to stop dangerous variants from spreading any further. Alsa Northcott tells us who is being targeted and why it's caused some local tension. Starting Monday, parents of kids at this school and several others in the area can get a COVID-19 vaccine. It's, it's a big priority because we are scared, you know? A relief for parent Shifat Isharmin. I'm ready. I'm happy. If they do that, I'm happy. We have more and more variants. Montreal health officials are trying to stay ahead of those variants by zeroing in on two areas with 26% of the city's new variant cases. We have outbreaks in daycare center or schools that comes in a household with a high attack rate and afterwards it moves on in workplaces or other community settings. Montreal Public Health says it's focusing on schools and daycares because they're linked to 86% of the cases in the areas. We are frontline workers. We're working with kids all day, every day. The pilot project doesn't include vaccines for teachers. It doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously, I'm concerned about catching COVID just like everybody else. And obviously, with the new variants, it's even more scary. The education minister tweeted that school staff should be included. But Montreal's public health director says the focus is on household transmission, at least for now. It's part of the difficult balance health officials are faced with, says this public health expert. Choice has to be made. And choice are not always the choice we would like to have. Uh, public health wants, it, wants to protect all Morelos and prevent the variant from spreading 
uh, to other parts of Montreal. But some parents are hesitant about getting priority. They should do it for the essential workers first. They are uh, more in contact with the people. Others say they hope it helps. We will support whatever it takes for our health and our family's health and the school's health. Health officials say they are considering expanding the pilot project to teachers and staff at the schools and daycares, but for now, they want to quickly get thousands of doses to parents. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Just east of Quebec, there's some happier news. That Atlantic bubble is set to come back one month from now. People in those four provinces will once again be able to travel back and forth without isolating. Kayla Hounsell introduces us to some of those who cannot wait. Nico Manos runs this surf shop and a surf school. He's thrilled to hear the Atlantic bubble will open once again. Last year it had a huge impact uh, for our business uh, and so we're hoping for the same this year. He says the bubble allowed him to keep his staff and keep the business going. And the Atlantic premiers agree that's exactly what they're trying to accomplish with the Atlantic Bubble 2.0. The uh, previous Atlantic Bubble was very successful, so uh, I'm eager to see that happen. The bubble first opened in July and held steady for nearly five months. It allowed residents of Atlantic Canada to travel between the provinces without isolating, as all other visitors must do. This time, Newfoundland and Labrador was almost excluded due to a recent outbreak. But in the end, the province got a conditional invite, as long as its recovery continues. So it's really great news, but it shows that we are ready to start moving again. And there's no reason that, uh, that we don't start moving. But all of these bubble plans are just that, plans. They're contingent on low COVID-19 case counts and high vaccination rates. You know, just because we're making the decision today doesn't mean that it's a firm thing. But for now, the bubble is back and families too are rejoicing. I love PEI, but I'm really anxious to have a road trip and especially go visit the grandkids. Now the question is, when will Atlantic Canada allow the rest of the country in? The premiers are still nervous about the variants. They say maybe, possibly, sometime during the summer. We do expect this summer to have more Canadian travel than we did last year. The surf shop, like so many others, needs tourists from the rest of Canada to match pre-pandemic revenue. Everyone wants to get back there, but not at the risk of losing the relative security of the Atlantic bubble. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Lawrencetown, Nova Scotia. New Brunswick health officials have another big concern. They are looking into more than 40 cases of a mysterious neurological disorder with symptoms resembling the fatal Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It most likely is a new disease. There, we, we haven't seen this anywhere else. Um, and so we're, it is of unknown etiology. The cases are in Moncton and the Acadian Peninsula. Doctors believe the disorder is linked to something environmental. However, officials are not calling it a public health threat. Well, Canada says Iran has not properly answered why it shot down Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752 last year, where 85 Canadians were killed. The Transportation Safety Board says Iran's report is not satisfactory, but victims' families say neither is the response from the Canadian government. Ashley Burke has the details. Iran has admitted its military shot down the plane, but 15 months later still hasn't explained why. We believe that the, uh, the final report issued by Iran uh, yesterday is incomplete. It, it raises more questions than it answers. Iran maintains an air defense unit mistook the commercial jet for a hostile target, then fired two missiles, the plane exploding when it hit the ground, killing 176 people, most headed to Canada. Iran calls that human error. To date, Iran has provided no evidence to support this scenario. However, it is a plausible explanation. In Canada, we just go passive and say, yes, it's plausible, yeah, it's very, you know, I, I, I don't accept that. Hamid Ismailion says victims' families believe it could have been intentional. His wife, Parisa, and nine-year-old daughter, Rira, were on board. Where is my daughter now? She, has, she was supposed to be at the school in grade five right now, but she's in a cemetery in Elgin Mills. And this is not right. We deserve to know the truth. And I know I want to know what happened to my wife and my daughter. This is my right. And none of these press conferences, none of these politicians answer me. I have to beg. I have to ask all of them, do something for us. 
He says Canada's failing families and is now turning to Ukraine for help after it launched a criminal case and its foreign minister came out strong. He said this is not a report but a collection of manipulations aimed at not establishing the truth but acquitting the Islamic Republic of Iran. This week from Canada's government. We believe that the most effective way to the, get to the bottom of this, to get to the truth, to get to, the, to, to justice, is we do it through multilateral organizations, through international institutions. He says Canada will roll out an action plan in the coming weeks. Victims' families ultimately want the case brought to the International Court of Justice so they can have their day in court. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. A CBC News team spent the day in a detention camp that is called a hotbed of radicalization. It is in Kurdish-controlled northeastern Syria, not far from the border with Iraq. Tens of thousands are housed in that camp. Some are said to be part of ISIS sleeper cells, but others just want to go home. Margaret Evans has this exclusive look. This is where the desperate and the dangerous live. A sprawling prison camp in northern Syria where the jailers warn the embers of the Islamic State still smolder. Jabertsia Mustafa, who manages the camp, says ISIS ideology is spreading across it. It's a threat to everyone, he says. The camp holds some 60,000 people, mainly families of ISIS militants, now either dead in prison or at large. Many arrived in 2019 after the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, now guarding the camp, played a key role in defeating the Islamic State territorially. Spokesman Kino Gabriel says ISIS is using the camp to create a state within a state. Basically, we just moved uh, al Barros, which was the last ISIS stronghold. Before it was defeated, we just moved it to al Hol camp. Dozens of people have been murdered in the camps since the new year, some reportedly for not following ISIS edicts. Iraqis and Syrians make up most of the population, but there are other nationalities too. The ones Syrian Kurds are begging their governments to take home. Hello, where are you from? Do you think your government should come and, and take you home? Do you want to go back to Russia? No, she tells us. She wants to go and live with the family of her husband in Raqqa. This area is called the Annex, the only place we're allowed to enter and briefly. There are about eight to 10,000 um, people in this part of the camps. We're actually seeing the kids are starting to throw stones at us and they're using slingshots. We're not particularly welcome here, but these are kids, of course. And we're going to move back actually right now just because uh, they've got some pretty good aim. And they already know the odds are stacked against them. The generation camp workers warn are in danger of radicalization. There were some smiles today. 3,000 Syrians on their way home. How do you feel? I'm, I'm so happy because I'm going back to my home. Did you have to say you are no longer a member of the Islamic State? Yeah, we have nothing to say. They were released as part of an agreement with tribal leaders willing to vouch for them. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Al Ho, Syria. A marketplace investigation looks at a scam costing Canadians millions of dollars. Who told you that? The people that you have stolen money from. Why do you do that? Next on The National, one man's warning after his bank didn't warn him. Also, how did one of the world's most promising vaccine candidates become so controversial? We want our science to be black and white. And science is quite messy. What we really know about the AstraZeneca shot. Oh, company on my ride here today. And an unexpected road race caught on camera. This black ram was chasing me. We're on the case of the ram on the lamb. We're back into. Welcome back. The pandemic may have slowed down the economy, but scammers in Canada have been busier than ever. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says more than $34 million have been lost to scammers so far this year. In 2020, fraudsters took $107 million from Canadians. 
Now in a marketplace investigation, David Common looks at a person victimized by one scam that abused his trust in banks. You're speaking with a journalist. On the line is a scammer, likely in India, who just days ago stole $27,000. Who told you that? The people that you have stolen money from. Why do you do that? Her victim was Ahmed, who now fears for his safety. Just one of thousands of Canadians who've lost millions in the growing scam, in which the caller poses as a bank investigator. And her words were, your entire ID has been stolen. Following instructions, Ahmed took out loans from his bank and bought gift cards at multiple stores in what the fraudster described as a trap to catch those who'd stolen his identity. What has all of this done to your well-being, your health? It has shaken both of us. Ahmed has cancer and may be paying off the debt of the scam for years to come. He accepts personal responsibility, but can't understand why his bank didn't warn him as British bank staff are specifically trained to do when customers make large or unusual withdrawals. Certified fraud examiner Jennifer Ford-Smith says Canadian banks should routinely be doing the same. But that's where we want the banks to be saying to customers, let's all take a step back and really consider whether this is legitimate or not. Ahmed's bank, RBC, says they have sophisticated monitoring systems and controls and they can proactively contact clients to confirm certain transactions. Still, there is no requirement forcing banks to warn people like Ahmed, and he says no one did. He's warning others that scammers have more info about us, our families, even our banking habits, all to help them seem more legitimate. David Common, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. Okay, you can tune in tomorrow for more on that important investigation as well as a look at romaine lettuce recalls and why our salads might be making us sick. That is tomorrow night on Marketplace, 8 p.m. on CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. And ahead tonight, how the AstraZeneca vaccine became so controversial. This is a pandemic. If we're not changing our mind, there's something wrong. The science says it's effective, so why is there so much confusion and criticism? But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Hi, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight, we are going to set the stakes ahead of the Conservative Policy Convention. Do you know who this is? Probably not. He's no celebrity. What Erin O'Toole needs to do to change, improve things. Andrew Chantal and Althea will join all of us right after this. my honor to declare the 2021 Conservative Party National Convention officially open. The stakes are high at the start of this virtual convention. Aaron O'Toole's first since becoming leader. More than six months into the job, this is a political opportunity to share policies and reach voters ahead of the next election. Do you know who this is? Probably not. He's no celebrity. But O'Toole is also facing political challenges with reports of internal divisions and no bumps in the polls. So what does O'Toole need to accomplish over the next three days or so? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody. Can't remember who I started with next week, so we'll, I'll just maybe pick a name out of that. Uh, Aaron O'Toole's keynote uh, that's happening on Friday. It's, it's his first speech of this kind. I wonder what he has to do, do we think? Uh, Althea, why don't you start us off in terms of who he's speaking to, the substance he needs to deliver? I think he needs to tell the Canadian public who Aaron O'Toole is. Um, he has been defined by the people who are opposed to him in his caucus and outside of his caucus for the last several months. He has not put that much in the window. When he has put things in the window, they have not been greeted um, by large swaths of the conservative movement uh, positively. I think of the reach out to union members, for example, uh, the sphere that he might move on carbon pricing. Um, and strangely, he is not talking to the members of the Conservative Party. He is talking to the Canadian public at this convention. And he will try, I think, to change the channel because at the moment, the convention is all about uh, what is not being discussed and a movement among some in the party who feel that the party has gone to great lengths to not hear from its base by uh, muzzling discussion that would normally occur at a party convention. 
And it's strange because, you know, uh, more than any other political party, I would say the Conservative Party is actually afraid of its members. The move that the party is trying to do to basically freeze out the social conservatives, who are a significant part of its base, um, it, it might actually prove to be troublesome down the road when it comes to fundraising and volunteers and really just the mood in the party. The, the fact, though, Chantal, that we are now um, six, six, more than six months into his leadership and, and he, he still has to explain what he stands for, uh, that seems problematic to me. And we've talked about how it might be because of the pandemic. But, but how, how clear does he have to be and how big an opportunity is this? Well, if I were asking the questions, and I'm not, I would ask, uh, what is the big idea that uh, Aaron O'Toole has brought to the Conservative Party over the past six months that is not something from uh, Andrew Scheer's era? Mm -hmm. And the reason why we spend so much time talking about social conservatives and their, their place in the party, possibly, is because there is a vacuum here. Now, in an ideal world, Aaron O'Toole would have an honest conversation with his members over the course of that speech. Uh, and he would also look for a way to explain to the other Canadians who will be watching how he is different from Andrew Scheer. Because, uh, and on one topic in particular that I think many Conservatives uh, uh, agree with, at some point, Aaron O'Toole is going to have to tell his party and tell Canadians why he is a more serious leader on climate change. And if he leaves that convention with a cut and pasted position from Andrew Scheer's platform on mm. climate change, he will have lost that convention. Wow. So, so what, what's the likelihood we hear that kind of policy from him, Andrew, do you think? Uh, I think the situation is more serious than that. Uh, uh, I don't think his primary goal or purpose with this speech is to reach out to the broader public, as necessary and important as that is. I think he's got much more trouble in the party uh, that he's got to address. He's got a party. I mean, this is going to be a convention that is unusually stage managed, even by the stage managed traditions of Canadian conventions, because of it's a virtual convention. That means it's going to have less of a natural audience for the public because it's all going to be on you know, a virtual thing rather than a, or the razzmatazz of a usual convention. But it also means that they're going to be able to, as they see it in the party hierarchy, to, to tamp down the base and keep them from running amok. But the base is going to be not necessarily terribly happy about that. So yeah. you've got a base that is already confused, divided, not sure where the party's going, not sure what to make of uh, Aaron O'Toole, who, after all, has now, you know, made manifest about five different versions of himself. I think he's got repair work to do with the party first. Okay, so so an easy job for one speech on a Friday <laughs> night. Um, is is yeah, there? But, but, yeah, go ahead, Chantal. Yeah. But in a virtual convention, I don't think that he can do a lot of repair work with the party, uh, and, and I don't think he can avoid the fact that that speech is probably what most non-conservatives will see of the convention. Yeah. I don't think that uh, most, except we will but then we're junkies. But most voters will not be sitting a Saturday online to watch yeah. that convention. Uh, well, Andrew, you want to jump just, in, and then I'll go to Althea. Yep. Just let me put it this way. If, if the speech doesn't land well with the general public, that's a real missed opportunity. If it doesn't land well with the party it, it itself, he's in real trouble. Althea. I would love to say that it really, really matters, but it doesn't at all. I mean, Andrew Shearer had a great speech in 2018. And then he proceeded to flare out completely during the campaign. And I say this knowing that he actually won more votes than the Liberals who ended up forming the government. But, you know, it, it, this is not a, a precursor, I think, of things to come. But in the short term, it would be good if the speech lands. Yeah. So let me ask you, does he have time to... Um improve the situation? Because the, the polls are not good. They are worse than they were under Scheer. Um, and, and they don't seem to be moving. You would normally get a bump. He doesn't have the bump. So Althea, does he have time to repair things and to get people's attention in case there is an election in just a few months? This is like a roundabout way of asking me when I think the election campaign no, is going to No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. No, I would never do that to you. <laughs> I don't know if he has time because I don't know uh, when the campaign is going to be. I think the problem with Aaron O'Toole, and I think we've come to realize this, is it's really hard to define yourself uh, when you haven't already been defined 
uh, prior to a leadership, and he is struggling to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, that is that is his fault because he keeps switching in different directions all the time. Um, so I, I don't know if he has enough time. Uh, you know, I think that there is. I don't see why the Liberals can't keep governing until the end of their mandate. Uh, they have a willing supporter with the NDP, so perhaps Aaron O'Toole has a long runway ahead. <laughs> Chantal. Right. Um, <laughs> yes, and possibly they might want to do that so that they don't lose Aaron O'Toole as their main adversary. No. Um, seriously, three months before the 2015 election, Justin Trudeau was running in third place. And... Uh, Weeks before the 2006 election, Paul Martin was winning. So the, the time thing, it's a question of context. That being said, at this point, the message Canadian voters who are not conservatives are getting is that this is a party that has so many issues to settle within itself that it is not a serious contender for power. Andrew. The difference with uh, between this party and the Stephen Harper Conservatives of 2006 or the Justin Trudeau Liberals of 2015 is that those parties were willing to take chances and to take bold policy declarations. This party is gives every appearance of being thoroughly unnerved. That's a part of a broader problem with conservatives and conservative parties in Canada and abroad. In the last 10, 20 years, they have really kind of lost their way of what, in the sense of what it is they stand for. It's why you see things like the Trump eruption. Uh, but it's also post-pandemic. You've got a liberal government that can afford, so they believe, to be all things to all people. They've been re released from the budget constraint. They are handing out money to every constituency and every interest and every individual in the country. Uh, at some point, the price for that is going to come due. But unfortunately for the Conservatives, that's probably after the next election. Okay, I could have done probably 20 more minutes on this topic, <laughs> but there'll be another time. Thank you all very much. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Ad Issue, the podcast for extra content. We're going to talk about a couple more topics there, including the panel's take on this one. We are assessing how we can loan doses. That is our aim. God bless America. They're coming to our rescue. <laughs> you can check that out on any major podcast app. Our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Hi again, Rosie. So, Rosemary Barton Live, Sunday, what have you got? Well, uh, we, we know many businesses have struggled throughout the pandemic, Adrian, but there's one Canadian business that has gone through the roof and is now the most valuable company in Canada, and that is none other than Shopify, based here in Ottawa. But it's also really helped a lot of small and medium-sized businesses shift to their product online and create an online presence. We're going to talk to the president of that company, Harley Finkelstein, about what that means and what the future of work and retail might look like post-pandemic. All right, we all want to know that. Thanks, Rosie. <laughs> okay, thanks. And next, what do we know about the AstraZeneca vaccine? How one of the world's most promising vaccine candidates became so controversial, and what cost might come with that? A little company on my ride here today. And a low-speed chase, if you will, caught on video. We'll get the story oh, behind gosh. this moment a little later. Welcome back. Several European Union countries say they will start giving the AstraZeneca vaccine once again on the heels of an announcement by the EU's drug regulator that the vaccine is indeed safe and effective. And today, Britain's Prime Minister gave a personal endorsement of the shot. I'm getting mine tomorrow and the centre where I'm getting jabbed is currently using the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. The backdrop to this are reports of blood clots in a small number of people who got the AstraZeneca shot. But today, the European Medicines Agency says the benefits outweigh any possible risks. Now, the question is, will people trust it? Most likely will, and already have. But this is just one in a long series of ups and downs for the vaccine. And when confidence in a vaccine gets rattled, there are real consequences. What do you know about AstraZeneca? What do you know about the AstraZeneca vaccine? What do you know about AstraZeneca? These days, seems everyone has heard something. I think the AstraZeneca, they say it is a less percentage for stopping you, you getting COVID. The clinical trial didn't do people above 65. There wasn't enough information on 65-year-olds and over. Some countries have decided to put the pause on it. I think um, there were some trials in Europe for blood clot-related things. As far as I know, they're like very unsubstantiated. 
Just keeping up is almost a full-time job, but how many of us have the scientific know-how to come to the right conclusions? Because it sounds like everybody's changing their minds or they don't know what they're doing, uh, it, it's, it's really hard for the general public to, to sort through to get to the best information. Here's some breaking news now. CNN has learned alarming details about what caused drug giant AstraZeneca to halt its vaccine trial. Consider how, from the very start, errors and anxiety during clinical trials would plant the seed in public perception that maybe this was sloppy science. Currently, we're still going back and forth with the company with respect to some data. And the impression would stick. The AstraZeneca vaccine was second class. If I had had the chance to, uh, to choose, I would have wanted to have the Pfizer one. There was a flip-flop on whether the vaccine was effective in seniors. And of course, recent questions about a possible link to blood clots being investigated in Europe. More than a dozen countries would put the vaccine on pause. We have to keep reminding the public that this virus is a moving situation. Margaret McNeil is a health communications expert at the University of Toronto who has watched every step of the AstraZeneca saga unfold in a very public, very piecemeal way. We want our science to be black and white. And science is quite messy. And even experts have a hard time explaining away apparent contradictions. Two months ago, you said I shouldn't get this vaccine. Now you're telling me I should get this vaccine. And unfortunately, places like France and Germany are dealing with this. France is one of several European countries that decided early on it was premature to believe AstraZeneca was effective in seniors. A medical decision that was also political, but the way it was communicated. Je rappelé, des mesures de... French President Emmanuel Macron would tell reporters AstraZeneca was quasi ineffective in older people. And even as governments one by one changed their minds, the perception stuck. <laughs> And today, somewhere between half and three quarters of all AstraZeneca vaccines in the country sit unused. It's a wake-up call for Canada. The best vaccine for you to take is the very first one that is offered to you. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's recent plea after a weekend in Montreal where 12% of people in one neighborhood who showed up for their vaccinations refused them after learning it was the AstraZeneca shot. And consider the slippery slope of playing favorites during a public health emergency. It's telling that one of the most common questions we get from CBC viewers is, can I choose which vaccine I get? Two others that we get quite often, what happens if I refuse a vaccine? And if I get the AstraZeneca shot, can I still get a Pfizer or Moderna booster later? Experts all around agree there's nothing easy about navigating a pandemic. Hey, Dr. McGear. One second, let me just, eventually I'll get control over two computers or two screens or whatever the heck it is. Dr. Allison McGear's advice, be flexible and understand that course changes happen. Okay. This is a pandemic. If we're not changing our mind, there's something wrong. I hope we're gonna change our mind because every day new data comes and as new data comes, you try to make better decisions about how you're rolling out vaccines. Makes people like But another prominent infectious diseases specialist, Dr. Zane Chagla, adds those decisions need to be much better communicated. You need public uptake to be as optimal as possible. But how do you communicate this effectively? How do you make sure the messaging is on par with all these stakeholders at play such that it seems like it's coming from a single voice rather than four different voices saying four different things? And that's the key when you consider one of the simplest truths in this pandemic. Once a fact or number or concern gets out, it can be very difficult to rein back in. So I'm guessing uh, there's a whole raft of lessons in the AstraZeneca story. Yeah, sure. And so, you know, the federal committee uh, that issues guidance and recommendations on the usage of vaccine in Canada has already learned one such lesson, and that is, so NACI is what we're talking about there, and they've vowed that they will hold, for example, a, a technical briefing with journalists every single time that they have written recommendations uh, to give on the use of vaccines. But even beyond that, the bottom line that a lot of experts told me was that, look, 
the AstraZeneca vaccine, it is safe, it is effective, mm -hmm. it is cheap, it is easy to transport, it is easy to store. This is a vaccine that they would have expected most of the world to get and not one that the world can afford to have undercut by confusion or misinformation. They need that one to stick. Yeah. All right. Up next, how the pandemic brought new hope to a group in Yellowknife. The pandemic has been very difficult on many people, but it's also birthed this. We'll take you inside a COVID-19 shelter, giving people a place to live and the help they need. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, eight people shot dead in Atlanta, six of them Asian women, and a growing sense of grief and dread about anti-Asian hate crimes. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The pandemic is so hard on so many, but for one group of people in Yellowknife, it has actually improved their lives. A COVID-19 isolation shelter is providing a home for people who didn't have one. Kate Kyle shows us why they hope the program is more than just a temporary measure. Brit, I got poster, I got barter, so I'm covered. Those three basics show just how much Alfred Bedsidia's life has changed. Before the pandemic, he was homeless, seeking refuge from the cold when he could in stairwells and the Salvation Army shelter. And I'm so fortunate that I have a, I have a place to stay to call home. Home right now is Spruce Bow, Yellowknife's COVID isolation shelter. When COVID hit last March, the territorial government and the Yellowknife Women's Society quickly converted this former motel into a place for vulnerable people to isolate. The point was to get people off the streets. Yeah, the pandemic has been very difficult on many people, but it's also best this. Up here is just rooms with... Spruce Bow is the first facility of its kind in Yellowknife. Clients have their own rooms, three meals a day, and nurses visit several times a week. Hi, Mr. John. There's even a managed alcohol program on site. Just taper off slowly. I don't want to shut her down cold stone. John James Small Geese gets a few ounces of alcohol every few hours, if he needs it, to help battle his addiction. I'm sleeping good. Eating good, feels good in the inside. Somebody cares. I feel happier. Joanne Lenny and Andrew Suey hadn't had stable housing for years. Here, Lenny managed to get back to work and has saved enough money to soon move into their own home. Well, I wish come true. It's, it finally happened, you know. Funding for the shelter has been extended for six months. After that, Betsidia isn't sure what home will look like. But for now... I'm feeling very, very much happy. And like many people here, he's also hopeful this type of facility will one day become permanent. Kate Kyle, CBC News, Yellowknife. Okay, next on The National, a sheep on the loose. How this friendly ram made a brand new friend. Our moment is next. If you decided to go biking in northwestern Ontario, you probably wouldn't be surprised to run into a dog, a deer, maybe even a bear. But one cyclist was certainly caught off guard by this guy. That is Ozzy the Ram. Okay, so Ozzy is apparently quite the extrovert, getting to know people as much as he can. The story behind his adventure and his new friend is tonight's moment. A little company on my ride here today. I got closer. I'm like, oh, it's a sheep. And then as I rode by, it's a, it's a ram. He had these big horns. And I looked at him and he looked at me. He broke out into a full run behind me. If I slowed down like under 20 kilometers an hour, he was he was able to close the gap. It's pretty quick, too. It was it was so funny. It was almost like we've, we've got a little comedy show. We got Ozzy about two weeks ago. And my husband says, are you sure he's not going to leave the yard? I said, honey, I promise he's not going to leave the yard. I was like, oh my God, he chased a biker. <laughs> oh no. Ram's name is Ozzy and it has an Instagram account. Uh, so I looked him up and I sent, I sent Ozzy a message on Instagram saying, hey, it's your cyclist friend. Got to meet, <laughs> meet Ozzy. They both apologized to each other. <laughs> and, and the misunderstanding. <laughs> we had a little 
reunion and it was fun and this whole thing has been pretty hilarious <laughs> so it's a friendly so, apparently uh, yeah there's a lot I don't get about this story, including, like, why his reaction would be to slow down as the Ram... So we're all lonely in the pandemic. I have to say, I feel like I, <laughs> I relate to Ozzy. That will be me running down the highway after friends and people <laughs> soon. That is a national for March 18th. Good night. Good night.